apologies, I was a little bit late in arriving. So if you've answered my first question, just leave it at that and I'll get the text later. I'm just going to ask you questions because I'm interested to hear what you have to say about a few issues. First of all, the 500 million support that's been afforded to EU farmers. Um, is there any conditionality attached to that, Michael? Is it a straightforward fund or what conditions are attached to it? I mean, how does the Commission envisage that this money would be spent? Or is it largely being left up to Member States to decide uh, what's needed? Secondly, in the context of sustainability and climate change, obviously, we are all operating in that context, and agriculture must also. And I'm going to ask you a few questions about Ireland in particular. So in Ireland, um, how can we reorient our agricultural models, um, both in the short and in the long term, um, to try to ensure greater sustainability. Now, I'm not asking you to preempt the Agri Council on Monday, but just a, a sort of a general overview on that. My third question is, if I had to go into a meeting tonight in North Leitrim or South Sligo to a group of sheep farmers, hill farmers or suckler farmers, and we were to discuss climate change, and I said to them, I was at a meeting this morning of the European... Now, this is not going to happen, but um, unless they call a meeting in the afternoon. Um, and I, I said, I was at a meeting this morning with Michael Scannell about food security. Um, what, what message could you give them as you know, hill farmers, suckler farmers, etc. Because when we talk to farmers, you know, about the cap and about food production, many farmers will still say, look, the cap was brought in in the first place to ensure food security. And to, to most farmers, that means you produce more food. They see that as a, a simple straight line. And if you were to just give them one message, what might that be? And finally, I, I didn't attend it, but one of my staff members did and took notes a, a recent seminar you were speaking at on food security. I think it might have been the European Commission had a seminar, was it last week? And one of the questions you were asked was, what one single action could be taken to avoid a global food crisis? And the answer you gave was about to stop the war. But Let's put that, you may have given more, but that's what I have here. Let's put that one aside. After that, uh, let's assume that the, the status quo remains for the next six months, 12 months. What single action, I think, um, I would ask you, would you uh, consider could be um, taken in order to afford, sorry, to um, avoid a global food crisis. Thanks, Michael. Deputy, thank you. Over to you, Michael. Okay. Well, first question, uh, and no, uh, I didn't touch on it earlier, the conditionality in relation to the 500 million package announced on the 23rd of March. Uh, and by the way, that can be, and in most cases, was accompanied with um, a similar increase, or rather twice as much from national funds. So basically, twice, uh, twice as much again. So one and a half billion in total. Yes, there is conditionality. Uh, essentially, member states were expected to target those farmers who are most directly uh, impacted by rising input costs, including especially fertilisers. Uh, and we've already had reports from the member states on who they've targeted accordingly. It was mostly the livestock industry because they were very hard hit by very sharp increases in uh, in animal feed costs. Cereals producers, on the other hand, even though fertilizer costs and energy costs had risen sharply, did benefit from even sharper increases in producer prices. So by and large, uh, uh, as I say, the livestock sector seemed to have been the biggest beneficiary across all the member states. And we will produce in due course a report on the overall take-up, et cetera, et cetera. The conditionality requirements left a lot of flexibility to the member states. Frankly, we're, uh, we're around a long time here in the Commission. Uh, we accept uh, that 
situation varies enormously from one member state to another, from one sector to another sector, and indeed even within sectors. So there's no single one-size-fits-all approach. You have to give member states sufficient flexibility to allow them to basically target who is most deserving of support. And I've heard nothing to suggest that they've abused that flexibility. Hopefully, I won't be disappointed as and when we actually get around to checking uh, how they spent it, etc. On the issue of how we reorientate our systems, and you mentioned specifically Ireland, uh, it comes back to the CAP strategic plan. The whole, you know, perhaps the single biggest, um, let's say, uh, reform of the CAP was that we were given uh, member states the flexibility to basically design their own agri-food production systems within the framework of the CAP, adapted to their own needs and challenges, and that includes climate change and sustainability. And, and Deputy Cleary would be very familiar from this from his own time as, as, as an agriculture minister. So Ireland has in its own hands, basically, the instruments to design a system that's fit for Ireland. Of course, we in the Commission have an obligation to ensure that that conforms to the overall structures, that it's consistent and coherent with what other member states are doing. And then there's an obligation on all of us to ensure that it fits in, fits in within the wider uh, uh, Green Deal, Farm to Fork, uh, Fit for 55 objectives, i.e. on creating a sustainable agri-food production system that basically will keep us fed without uh, excessive contributions to greenhouse gas emissions, et cetera, et cetera. It's a big challenge, but it has to be met because if we if we fail on that at member state level, at EU level, the consequences will be huge, including on food production. Uh, uh, again, the Commission insists that there's uh, food sustainability and food security are not uh, opposites. They're entirely complementary to one another. If we fail on one, we'll fail on the other. Uh, Moving on, on you know the message to uh, uh, hill farmers, suckler farmers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think the big strength of those sectors uh, in terms of the cap, sustainability, etc., is apart from contributing to food supply, they're extremely rich in their contribution towards uh, biodiversity and rural development. Because sustainability isn't only about economics, uh, and we've stressed this. There are three pillars: there's the, the economic. Uh, the social and the environmental. And these sectors especially contribute hugely on, 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 on the social, indeed the environmental, uh, the quality dimensions. Uh, and I, I think uh, if I were working in any of these sectors, I would be very proud of what I'm doing. And they should be proud and, and they should be supported in what they're doing. Uh, and I know that sometimes they feel that they're being ignored, et cetera, et cetera, but that's not the case, and it shouldn't be the case. It would be a big mistake. And then finally, in terms of, uh, again, what single issue would help? And yes, I did mention stop the war in uh, Ukraine. That would help hugely. But putting that aside, uh, innovation, uh, basically, unless our uh, agri-food production systems, unless our societies in general become ex uh, much more innovative, and how we deal with uh, uh, how we use energy, on, 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 on how we find alternatives, on how we deal with climate change, etc. We're going to be in huge trouble. And again, the cap reform puts a, a very heavy stress uh, on innovation, because traditionally, historically, it, it's always innovation that ultimately comes to the rescue. So if we are to move to systems that use less fertilizers, less plant protection products, et cetera, et cetera, we're going to have to find new technologies that allow us to basically uh, meet these objectives. So as I say, the one word, innovation.